Hello everyone, this is the lecture for exercises for impaired balance. All right, first I want to go over some background concepts. Most of this should be a review from biomechanics, but uh, the first is center of mass. Uh, this is the point that corresponds to the center of your total body mass, and it's the point in which the body is in perfect equilibrium. Um, you, it's found by taking the weighted average of the center of mass of, of all your body segments. But the center of gravity is the vertical projection down towards the ground um, of the body. So in the anatomical position, the center of gravity in most humans is located anterior to the second sacral vertebrae um, at about 55% 50, 55 of your height. But realize as you move, that center of gravity may change. So as you see on this individual here, the center of gravity is actually outside of this individual's body um, because of the vectors of all the force that's uh, being caused from his upper extremity being bent, uh, and his upper body being bent over. Uh, momentum. This is a product of mass times velocity. So linear momentum means the body is moving along a straight path, uh, such as in the sagittal or the transverse plane. But angular momentum is when there's rotational velocity of, uh, of the body. Uh, base of support. This is the perimeter of the contact area between the bottom, I'm sorry, between the body and the support surface. When you're standing, it's typically your feet. Uh, when you're sitting, it might be um, your butt and the back of your thighs. Um, when a person has a wider base of support, they have increased stability. So this may be why you see elderly or individuals who have poor balance. They may be walking with their legs in a wider stance. Um, and it's also why it's more difficult to stand in tandem stance than it is in regular stance because you have decreased the base of support. As long as a person maintains their center of gravity within the limits of that base of support, um, they are, that's referred to as being within the limits of their stability, and they shouldn't fall. So here, as you see, the individual is standing, um, and his the base of support is narrow and standing. It is based over the feet. In walking, it is actually moving because the person is moving too. So the base of support on the gentleman's left leg in the middle when he first takes a stance is actually from where he is and moving forward. And then when the base of support, when the le that left leg is in the back, um, he is at the front of that base of support. And as you can see, when you're sitting, you have a wider base of support. It goes all the way from your bottom to the back of the thigh, whatever stretching is there. If the feet here were on the ground, the base of support may even be wider. Your center of mass can change when you move from anatomical neutral or when you carry a heavy object. So as you're sitting there listening to my lecture, I want you just to sit up straight and not have your back supported on a chair and feel the amount of weight. It should be fairly symmetrical on your right and left leg. And then without contracting anything to um, stabilize your core, just take your right arm and move it out to the right. You should feel that your center of mass moved to the right because you had to put more weight on that right leg uh, when you did that. So the same thing's gonna happen to this gentleman in this picture. When he leans forward, his center of mass will move forward. Added to that is the heavy weight that's in his arm. And so the center of gravity may be beat on his base of support, and that may cause him to fall. So as you see here in this picture, his center of gravity is outside of that base of support. Okay, limits of stability. These are the boundaries that you can sway without changing your base of support. The wider your base of support, the bigger that cone is going to be. So your limit of stability is how far you can move. So think if you're standing, you can sway back and forth somewhat without falling. The typical adult um, can sway about um, 12 degrees um, from posterior to anterior without losing their um, balance. Um, in seated, you can go further than that because of the wider base of support. So you can go approximately 16 degrees um, from posterior to anterior. Um, if you increase your base of support, that will obviously increase too. 
Right, the next concept is ground reaction force, and this is based on Newton's law of reaction. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That occurs when your foot strikes the ground. So the force of your foot striking the ground causes a reaction from the ground up the body. And this angle, this reaction that's happening occurs at an angle that is a combination of all the vectors and all the forces that are being created. This will move as an individual moves. So if you just look through the um, phases of gait, which you will learn more of next year, but when this individual first touches the ground, the ground reaction force is at a different angle than when this individual is standing straight up or even, even moving forward. The center of pressure is um, directly related to the ground reaction force, and it is the point on the ground, that center area, um, where the ground reaction force is being projected. Um, when both feet are on the ground, um, it may be somewhere in between the feet, but when there's only one foot on the ground, the net center of pressure is within that foot. In order for you to maintain stability, you must control your center of mass over that, or your center of gravity over that um, center of pressure. Um, this is not something we typically measure in a clinic. It's just something you need to understand. We do have a um, very nice ground um, gait analysis uh, force plate that we can use to uh, help uh, understand this better. And typically, when many people think of balance, they're thinking of proprioception, and that is the only thing they think of when they're thinking of balance. But you must understand that balance is a multifaceted concept. It involves the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system, and contextual, contextual factors, and we will talk about many of these. Um, but if you think about this, so muscle performance, you have to be strong enough to hold yourself upright. You have to be able to move that extremity where your brain tells it to. Joint integrity means you need to have the stability within a joint so that when you move and put pressure on it, it does what it should. Uh, range of motion, if you don't have proper range of motion, you may not be able to uh, perform the tasks that are needed to maintain balance. You also need proper postural alignment to be able to keep your body upright and the sensation to be able to tell your brain what is going on. Within the nervous system, your brain takes that information and applies it. It tells the body to make different motor strategies and adaptive me mechanisms to be able to uh, correct any uh, balance problems. It also anticipates problems and prepares the body so that you have more stable balance. Um, this processing and taking all the feedback that it is getting, uh, that, the, that the brain is getting, helps to maintain balance. And then there's contextual, uh, con I'm sorry, contextual effects. So the environment, um, what type of surface are you on? Are you on carpet? Are you walking on wood? Or are you walking on a wet tile floor? All three of those are, are flat surfaces, but they're, the body's going to react differently to it. You also have to take into effect gravity that is always in play. Um, lighting, if someone has poor vision or needs a lot of lighting they aren't able to see, that will um, that can come into play. And also the characteristics of the task. What are you asking that patient to do? All right, so we're going to talk about sensory systems and how they affect balance control. So we have listed here several systems that are related to sensory and balance control. Visual, somatosensory, vestibular, uh, sensory organization, and then we're going to talk about different types of balance control. So first let's talk about vision. So vision provides you a reference to where you are relative to the environment. So if you're standing up and the world suddenly looks like it's turning one way, you're probably falling the other way. So it does give you a good cue as to where you are in space. Um, vision helps you orient your head to maintain a level gaze. Um, and it also tells you how fast you're moving. If you move your head slowly to the right, your vision can see that things are slowly moving and tells your brain that. Um, when there's a loss of vision, there can 
it can really affect an individual's balance if that was one of the systems they were relying on. Sometimes the visual system provides inaccurate information for balance control. So if you've ever been in a car and you start to park and as you stop, the car beside you backs up, your vision system may make you think that you're continuing to move forward and you may hit your brakes quickly thinking that you're rolling forward, where really you're not moving forward, the car beside you is moving backward. And so um, that can create um, some difficulty in individuals who are relying solely or mostly on vision for their balance um, because it's giving altered feedback to the brain. All right, next we're going to talk about uh, another sensory system, the somatosensory system. Okay, so this system provides information about the position and motion of your body and your body parts uh, relative to each other. So this happens through proprioceptors such as mus uh, muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, joint receptors, and skin mechanoreceptors. So if you're standing, and you feel more weight going into your toes, your skin feels that. Additionally, you may have a change in a joint position that your uh, proprioceptors may tell the brain. Um, so this is well used when the surface is firm and not moving. If you're standing on a boat, you may get abnormal responses to the brain um, of what is not exactly happening. So again, think of how you're sitting right now. Feel the sensation in your legs and how much pressure is on different areas. If you lean forward just slightly, you will feel more pressure at the distal end of your thigh or uh, moving away from your ischial tuberosities. Um, also, your hip joint receptors, your trunk uh, receptors may also be telling your brain that you moved. All of this works together to provide input to your brain. All right, next we have the vestibular system. As you all learned in uh, neuroanatomy, the vestibular system um, is within your um, head. It will provide information on angular acceleration through the semicircular canals. So in other words, if you are rotating your head, it also will provide linear information, such as if you were going up and down or forward and backward. The vestibular system has a peripheral part, which is uh, the semicircular canals, the utricle and the saccule, and it also has central processing within the brain. So whether you have a uh, problem within the brain, which we would call a central nervous system problem, or a peripheral problem related to the vestibular system, there will be either um, increased, decreased, or altered uh, feedback given to your brain. Now we are going to talk about sensory organization for balance control, so another sensory system uh, that we use. So the vestibular system, the visual system, and all the somatosensory inputs go to your brain, and your brain combines this. It, or, it does sensory organization, so it organizes all this information to provide outputs to proper movement to allow for improved balance and stability. Um, with this processing, the fastest processing comes from the somatosensory information, followed by visual and then vestibular. When one of these inputs is given inaccurate information, your brain has to take the time to process that and determine the input from the other two systems. Um, being able to adapt this is called sensory organization. Most individuals can compensate very well if one of the three systems is impaired. Uh, this is the basis for many of our treatment programs. Um, you can use compensation uh, to improve the ability to balance, especially if one of these systems is impaired and not able to improve. So if there is a vestibular uh, difficulty that you can improve, you may want to work on the vestibular system. But if it is a problem of hypofunction that is not going to return, you need to work on other systems that um, can then compensate and help maintain balance. 
and types of balance control. We have speed forward or open loop, anticipatory, and closed loop. So feed forward, this is the open loop motor control. And this is utilized when movements occur too fast to rely on sensory feedback or anticipatory control. So this is, um, if you are standing and you're, not, you're on a train, but you don't realize it's getting ready to start. As soon as that train starts to move, that feed forward is used and your brain processes the information and has your lower extremity muscles contract appropriately to maintain proper balance. Um, anticipatory control is when you have postural reactions in advance of performing movement. So if you walk up to a door and you know it's a heavy door and get ready to pull on it, anticipatory control allows for activation of postural muscles, especially in that case, it would be your back extensors and um, posterior leg muscles to be able to pull that door open without causing you to fall or for you to go forward into the door. And then you have closed loop. So this um, is when you need precision movements that require sensory feedback. So if you're trying to balance sitting on a ball or balance standing on a BOSU, um, the reaction or the um, input you're gonna get from your somatosensory system and all the other systems are processed and then uh, the corrected movements are returned to the motor um, control parts, which are your muscles. There are many strategies that people use for maintaining proper balance. So one is the ankle strategy. Um, this is during quiet stance when you have a small perturbation, such as a slow speed movement or a gentle sway forward or backward, and the ankle uh, performs a contraction to allow you to restore uh, your balance and to keep your um, center of mass over the uh, base of support. Um, this is very common. Um, it occurs in uh, most daily tasks. And what happens is that, say you are moving and um, you have a loss of balance in the forward direction, your muscle activity starts in a distal to proximal sequence. So your gastroc will begin to contract followed by your hamstrings, and then your paraspinal musculature. So it works all the way up the chain and not just at the ankles. We call it an ankle strategy, but that's where the movement begins. Many parts of your body do contract to maintain proper balance. So weight shift strategy is um, for medial lateral uh, type perturbations. Um, the hips are the key control point of this, of this strategy. Um, so if you move your center of mass to the right, your right hip abductors and your left hip abductors work in unison to um, move you back over your body. You, did get, you do get some contribution from your ankle inverters and everters also. Suspension theory, or, or strategy, I'm sorry. Um, this is when a person lowers their center of mass to uh, improve their ability to balance. Um, this is often combined with the ankle and the weight shift strategy to enhance the effectiveness of balance movement. Um, but if you think about it, if the center of mass is high above the base of support, that's a pretty long lever arm. And so a little bit of force can move that easier. If you lower that center of gravity, um, you won't have to work as hard to maintain it over your center of, uh, or over your base of support. Okay, hip strategy. This is when you have larger uh, perturbations or uh, moments that cause uh, balance difficulties. So what happens here is you either use rapid hip flexion or rapid hip extension to move that center of mass within your base of support. Um, this is often used if you think of gymnasts when they are trying to not fall off the balance beam. They don't have the ability to use the ankle strategy as much because of such a narrow base of support. So they will throw their hips backwards to be able to maintain balance or sometimes throw their hips forward uh, quickly. Um, we see this often with bigger balance problems. Step strategy. This is when the center of mass is beyond the limits of stability. You have to enlarge your base of support to be able to regain control. Um, an uncoordinated step that follows a stumble is an example of a uh, stepping strategy. 
So it doesn't, it's not always controlled. Sometimes it is just what the patient has to do to maintain your balance. The research has shown that most responses are combined. It's very rare that an individual only uses ankle or only uses weight shift. Um, often they are combined to be able to uh, maintain proper balance. All right, what kind of balance control do we typically use under varying conditions? So during stance, if an individual is just standing still, um, the majority of the movement is controlled with the ankle muscles. So the ankle strategy or the uh, lateral sway is what, or the weight shift strategy is what you often see. Uh, with perturbations, it will depend on whether the movement was anticipatory so that the patient knew it was coming or was actually generating the movement, or was it a reaction from an externally generated perturbation. So perturbations and balance and standing um, can be proactive or reactive depending on uh, the, the, uh, the uh, source of the perturbation. All right, so balancing during a whole body lift. This is a common occurrence of uh, limited balance, especially in the elderly. And we need to understand what's going on uh, within this patient and within this situation to be able to properly treat it. So during a lifting movement, the body leans forward, which changes the, the center of mass. So the center of mass moves forward with it, which may put it closer to the anterior part of the uh, the base of support. Uh, when a load is added, that further puts the weight more anteriorly. Your body decides what weight it is getting ready to lift, so it anticipates that, and proper stabilization and um, activation of muscles occur. Um, but if the weight is too far forward or if the load was heavier than anticipated, the patient may lose their balance. Um, and that uh, would cause them to topple forward in the situation as above. Um, so lifting style does appear to affect this. And this is a difficult concept for most PTs to grasp because a lot of falls are common because of quadricep weakness. And re research has shown that Loss of balance is more common when the subjects use a lifting style where the knees are more flexed than when the knees are straighter. And we've always taught proper body mechanics with lifting and you want to bend the knees. Absolutely, we want these patients to bend their knees, but realize that a deep squat may increase their risk of falls. So that's where your clinical reasoning and critical thinking will come into effect. Um, what is safer for this patient? Do we need to protect their spine more? or do we need to protect their balance more? Or can there be a happy mix of both? And so your instructions to the patient will often depend on the patient that you see in front of you and uh, what their impairments and what their limitations are. All right, balance during normal gait. So uh, one of the things I've often heard is that the gait is a series of controlled falls. Your center of mass is typically outside your base of support. There's only a short period of time where the center of mass is within your base of support. And that is that short period of time when you have two feet on the ground. So right when you're shifting from walking uh, with your left leg forward, and then as soon as you put your right leg forward, you have two feet on the ground, and then you will lift up the other leg. Um, so to be able to accomplish this goal of controlled falls, a person must be able to maintain balance and posture of both their upper body, their heads, arms, and trunk, um, and the vertical alignment of their body against gravity. Um, their hip and trunk muscles also work to keep the upper body balanced, and your extensor muscles in the lower extrem extremities prevent vertical collapse. So there's a lot of things going on with gait. Uh, your ankle muscles must control uh, forward um, anterior posterior acceleration and some medial lateral movement, and they have to work in an open chain to prevent you from tripping over your toe. So those are a series of things that you need to think of. It's not just lower extremity strength, and it's not static balance that causes falls during uh, gait. It is this inability to control this dynamic movement. 
knowing what systems are causing balance costs will help you better treat it. So if you're not training the right system, you're not benefiting the patient. So we're going to talk about different um, impairments related to balance and so that you can assess and make sure that you're treating the proper impairment each time you're treating balance. All right, first we're going to talk about sensory input impairments. So sensory input impairments can be somatosensory, um, vision, or vestibular. So typical somatosensory visual or vestibular deficits can be um, things such as with somatosensory, it could be neuropathy, it could be limited proprioception following an injury. So any deficit within that musculoskeletal system or within the proprioceptive system providing feedback to the brain um, would be a somatosensory problem. Visual loss um, can be loss of visual acuity, peripheral field vision, or depth perception. If you think back to um, in geriatrics when you were trying to eat your spaghetti and some of you had vision loss in one eye, that depth perception was very difficult to be able to do your normal tasks. And then vestibular loss. So vestibular loss can be difficulties with the peripheral system, that vestibular apparatus, or from within the central nervous system. And these are treated differently. You will learn more about this in your adult neurological class uh, next semester. Okay, other problems can be from sensory motor integration impairments. That's what we're going to talk about next. So damage to motor areas of the brain um, that process the incoming sensory information can result in the sensory motor integration problems. If you have um, limitations within the brain that limit your ability to understand the proprioceptive information coming back, you may rely more on uh, vestibular um, senses or vision. So Many people can have loss in two areas and still have decent function because they rely on their good or still remaining functional areas for balance. But realize those who rely mostly on uh, vision uh, can get faulty information or inaccurate information, which may cause further balance loss. Okay, the next system we're going to talk about is biomechanical and other motor output impairments. So, an example of this in the musculoskeletal system would be something such as poor posture, decreased range of motion, or weakness. Uh, this is when there is a musculoskeletal problem that may be limiting balance. So, if you think of someone with poor posture, that's going to change their um, center, uh, center of mass and move it away from their base of support. It may move it anteriorly. Um, so correcting that may help their stability. Uh, someone who can't fully extend their leg has altered ground reaction forces that may cause their body to want to collapse. Um, if you have weakness in the hips, lower extremities, trunk, um, any of your postural muscles, that may uh, exhibit a problem when um, working on balance control. Then there's neuromotor. So um, individuals with neurological conditions such as Parkinson's, stroke, traumatic brain injury can show impaired coordination, inhibition of movement due to pain, and abnormal tone. So uh, fixing those problems is imperative when um, thinking about working with these balanced patients. And finally, we're going to talk about deficits related to aging and deficits from medications. You will cover a lot of this in geriatrics, and with the medications, you're going to cover it in pharmacology next year. So common risk factors for falls with aging include muscle weakness, history of falls, gait deficit, balance deficit. Obviously, a person will fall if they have more balance deficits, uh, use of an assistive device, visual problems, arthritis impaired activities of daily living, depression, cognitive impairment, and age over 80. So many of these seem self-explanatory. If they don't have good vision, we've talked about that's one of the big systems that helps with balance, they may have problems. If they have muscle weakness, they may have inability to uh, make the corrections needed that your brain is telling them to make. And then with medication, some of the risk factors, including taking four or more meds, so this um, uh, 
overuse of drugs or even just a pro proper use of drugs, but they need to take a lot is a risk factor for falls because the side effect for many medications um, can be dizziness or hypotension. Um, other medications that put you at risk are hypnotics, sedatives, antidepressants, tranquilizers, and high blood pressure medications. Right, many of these uh, balance tests you have already been over, um, but we will, I'm just going to describe the different balance tests and how they fit into a balance evaluation. So if you're looking for static balance tests, something such as a single leg test or the Romberg and sharpened Romberg are appropriate. That's telling you how they are able to balance in one position. For dynamic balance tests, it's uh, something such as the five times sit to stand. So you're not only checking their strength of their lower extremity, but you're assessing their balance. Anticipatory control are when you know you're going to be moving and you see what your body can do. So the functional reach and the Y balance. We will go over the Y balance in a uh, lab uh, on, for, this, for this unit. And uh, if you are part of the SPARTA FMS program, you will also learn that. Then there's reactive postural control, control tests. So observing how a patient respond is, responds to uh, being pushed or, being, or, or perturbation. Uh, sensory organizational test, you have the cat sib or the mo modified cat sib, and this looks at the ability of the body to integrate uh, the proprioceptive system, the vestibular system, and vision. Then you also have functional tests that do functional daily tasks, such as the timed up and go, you're going to stand and walk, the Berg, and the high mat. The dizziness handicap inventory is a self-reported test um, that is one of the functional outcomes that a patient can complete on their own. There are several evidence-based balance programs that have been shown to provide um, some prevention of falls. One is the Otago. It is a home exercise program and a program where uh, they perform, I think, the first two months with physical therapy. Uh, this is a program that was actually developed up at University of North Carolina, and I have provided a very lengthy document related to um, how to implement and, um, a, and set up this program with a patient. Uh, supervised group programs have also shown to decrease the chance of falls. Uh, circuit activities are great, so the multi-system group activities, if you look in your book, under this chapter, there's a well-delineated um, circuit activity that has been shown to decrease falls. And it's nice. It involves strengthening, working on stepping strategies, ankle and hip strategies, anticipatory reactions. So it is multifaceted and looks at many aspects of balance. And also Tai Chi. The slow, continuous, even rhythm movements facilitate sensory motor integration. Um, having to continuously weight shift from one leg to the other uh, facilitates that an anticipatory balance control. It helps with motor coordination and it also helps with lower extremity strengthening. And finally, management of impaired balance. So we're going to go through many balance activities during the lab. So static and dynamic balance control, um, anticipatory and reactive. So the difference between knowing that something's coming at you and reacting to it. Uh, we're going to talk about sensory organization and how to um, figure out what systems are being used the most so that you can then work the appropriate system. Uh, working on balance during functional activities. And realize safety during gait is very important. Make sure, uh, and, and during balance testing and balance training too. Make sure that you are always in a safe position with the patient using gait belts um, free of sharp areas. So if a patient does lose their balance, they're not going to hit their head on the side of a table. Uh, working within a parallel bar uh, setting is a good idea, as long as the patient isn't always holding onto those parallel bars, and then you think they have proper balance when really they're already holding on. So having the parallel bars there for um, use if the patient goes to fall is a good idea. But Make sure when you're within the parallel bars that the patient's not using them as a crutch and that you truly are working on balance.